Section 37 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 37. Siege of Vicksburg. I now determined upon a regular siege to outcamp the enemy, as it were, and to incur no more losses. The experience of the 22nd convinced officers and men that this was best, and they went to work on the defenses and approaches with a will. With the Navy holding the river, the investment of Vicksburg was complete. As long as we could hold our position, the enemy was limited in supplies of food, men, and munitions of war to what they had on hand. These could not last always. The crossing of troops at Bruinsburg commenced April 30th. On the 18th of May, the army was in rear of Vicksburg. On the 19th, just 20 days after the crossing, the city was completely invested and an assault had been made. Five distinct battles, besides continuous skirmishing, had been fought and won by the Union forces. The capital of the state had fallen and its arsenals, military manufactories, and everything useful for military purposes had been destroyed. An average of about 180 miles had been marched by the troops engaged but five days rations had been issued and no forage over six thousand prisoners had been captured and as many more of the enemy had been killed or wounded twenty-seven heavy cannon and sixty-one field pieces had fallen into our hands and four hundred miles of the river from vicksburg to port hudson had become ours the Union force that had crossed the Mississippi River up to this time was less than 43,000 men. One division of these, Blair's, only arrived in time to take part in the Battle of Champions Hill, but was not engaged there, and one brigade, Ransom's, of McPherson's Corps, reached the field after the battle. The enemy had, at Vicksburg, Grand Gulf, jackson and on the roads between these places over sixty thousand men they were in their own country where no rear guards were necessary the country is admirable for defense but difficult for the conduct of an offensive campaign all their troops had to be met we were fortunate to say the least in meeting them in detail at port gibson seven or eight thousand at Raymond, 5,000, at Jackson, from 8 to 11,000, at Champions Hill, 25,000, at the Big Black, 4,000. A part of those met at Jackson were all that was left of those encountered at Raymond. They were beaten in detail by a force smaller than their own, upon their own ground. Our loss up to this time was... Port Gibson, 131 killed, 719 wounded, 25 missing. South Fork, Bayou Pierre, 1 wounded. Skirmishes, May the 3rd, 1 killed, 9 wounded. 14 Mile Creek, 6 killed, 24 wounded. Raymond, 66 killed. 339 wounded, 39 missing. Jackson, 42 killed, 251 wounded, 7 missing. Champions Hill, 410 killed, 1,844 wounded, 187 missing. Big Black, 39 killed, 237 wounded, 3 missing. Bridgeport, 1 wounded total 695 killed 3425 wounded 259 missing 
of the wounded many were but slightly so and continued on duty not half of them were disabled for any length of time after the unsuccessful assault of the twenty second the work of the regular siege began sherman occupied the right starting from the river above vicksburg mcpherson the center MacArthur's division now with him and mcclernand the left holding the road south to warrenton lawman's division arrived at this time and was placed on the extreme left of the line in the interval between the assaults of the nineteenth and twenty-second roads had been completed from the yazoo river and chickasaw bayou around the rear of the army to enable us to bring up supplies of food and ammunition ground had been selected and cleared on which the troops were to be encamped and tents and cooking utensils were brought up the troops had been without these from the time of crossing the mississippi up to this time all was now ready for the pick and spade prentiss and hurlbut were ordered to send forward every man that could be spared cavalry especially was wanted to watch the fords along the big black and to observe johnston i knew that johnston was receiving reinforcements from bragg who was confronting rosecrans in tennessee vicksburg was so important to the enemy that i believed he would make the most strenuous efforts to raise the siege even at the risk of losing ground elsewhere my line was more than fifteen miles long extending from haines's bluff to vicksburg thence to warrenton the line of the enemy was about seven in addition to this having an enemy at canton and jackson in our rear who was being constantly reinforced we required a second line of defense facing the other way i had not troops enough under my command to man these general halleck appreciated the situation and without being asked forwarded reinforcements with all possible dispatch the ground about vicksburg is admirable for defense on the north it is about two hundred feet above the mississippi river at the highest point and very much cut up by the washing rains the ravines were grown up with cane and underbrush while the sides and tops were covered with a dense forest farther south the ground flattens out somewhat and was in cultivation but here too it was cut up by ravines and small streams the enemy's line of defense followed the crest of a ridge from the river north of the city eastward then southerly around to the jackson road full three miles back of the city thence in a southwesterly direction to the river deep ravines of the description given lay in front of these defenses as there is a succession of gullies cut out by rains along the side of the ridge the line was necessarily very irregular to follow each of these spurs with entrenchments so as to command the slopes on either side would have lengthened their line very much generally therefore or in many places their line would run from near the head of one gully nearly straight to the head of another and an outer work triangular in shape generally open in the rear was thrown up on the point with a few men in this outer work they commanded the approaches to the main line completely the work to be done to make our position as strong against the enemy as his was against us was very great the problem was also complicated by our wanting our line as near that of the enemy as possible we had but four engineer officers with us captain prime of the engineer corps was the chief and the work at the beginning was mainly directed by him his health soon gave out when he was succeeded by captain comstock also of the engineer corps to provide assistance on such a long line i directed that 
all officers who had graduated at west point where they had necessarily to study military engineering should in addition to their other duties assist in the work the chief quartermaster and the chief commissary were graduates the chief commissary now the commissary general of the army begged off however saying that there was nothing in engineering that he was good for unless he would do for a sap roller as soldiers require rations while working in the ditches as well as when marching and fighting and as we would be sure to lose him if he was used as a sap roller i let him off the general is a large man weighs two hundred and twenty pounds and is not tall we had no siege guns except six thirty-two pounders and there were none at the west to draw from admiral porter however supplied us with a battery of navy guns of large caliber and with these and the field artillery used in the campaign the siege began the first thing to do was to get the artillery in batteries where they would occupy commanding positions then establish the camps under cover from the fire of the enemy but as near up as possible and then construct rifle pits and covered ways to connect the entire command by the shortest route the enemy did not harass us much while we were constructing our batteries probably their artillery ammunition was short and their infantry was kept down by our sharpshooters who were always on the alert and ready to fire at a head whenever it showed itself above the rebel works in no place were our lines more than six hundred yards from the enemy it was necessary therefore to cover our men by something more than the ordinary parapet to give additional protection sandbags bulletproof were placed along the tops of the parapets far enough apart to make loopholes for musketry on top of these logs were put by these means the men were enabled to walk about erect when off duty without fear of annoyance from sharpshooters the enemy used in their defense explosive musket balls no doubt thinking that bursting over our men in the trenches they would do some execution but i do not remember a single case where a man was injured by a piece of one of these shells when they were hit and the ball exploded the wound was terrible in these cases a solid ball would have hit as well their use is barbarous because they produce increased suffering without any corresponding advantage to those using them the enemy could not resort to our method to protect their men because we had an inexhaustible supply of ammunition to draw upon and used it freely splinters from the timber would have made havoc among the men behind there were no mortars with the besiegers except what the navy had in front of the city but wooden ones were made by taking logs of the toughest wood that could be found boring them out for six or twelve pound shells and binding them with strong iron bands these answered as coke-horns and shells were successfully thrown from them into the trenches of the enemy the labor of building the batteries and entrenching was largely done by the pioneers assisted by negroes who came within our lines and who were paid for their work but details from the troops had often to be made the work was pushed forward as rapidly as possible and when an advanced position was secured and covered from the fire of the enemy the batteries were advanced by the thirtieth of june there were two hundred and twenty guns in position mostly light field pieces besides a battery of heavy guns belonging to manned and commanded by the navy we were now as strong for defense against the garrison of vicksburg as they were against us but i knew that johnston was in our rear and was receiving constant reinforcements from the east he had at this time a larger force than i had had 
at any time prior to the Battle of Champions Hill. As soon as the news of the arrival of the Union Army behind Vicksburg reached the north, floods of visitors began to pour in. Some came to gratify curiosity, some to see sons or brothers who had passed through the terrible ordeal. Members of the Christian and Sanitary Associations came to minister to the wants of the sick and the wounded. Often those coming to see a son or brother would bring a dozen or two of poultry. They did not know how little the gift would be appreciated. Many of the soldiers had lived so much on chickens, ducks, and turkeys without bread during the march that the sight of poultry, if they could get bacon, almost took away their appetite. But the intention was good. Among the earliest arrivals was the governor of Illinois, with most of the state officers. I naturally wanted to show them what there was of most interest. In Sherman's front, the ground was the most broken and most wooded, and more was to be seen without exposure. I therefore took them to Sherman's headquarters and presented them. Before starting out to look at the lines, possibly while Sherman's horse was being saddled, there were many questions asked about the late campaign, about which the North had been so imperfectly informed. There was a little knot around Sherman and another around me, and I heard Sherman repeating, in the most animated manner, what he had said to me when we first looked down from Walnut Hills upon the land below on the 18th of May, adding, Grant is entitled to every bit of the credit for the campaign. I opposed it. I wrote him a letter about it. But for this speech it is not likely that Sherman's opposition would have ever been heard of. His untiring energy and great efficiency during the campaign entitled him to a full share of all the credit due for its success. He could not have done more if the plan had been his own. On the 26th of May, I sent Blair's division up the Yazoo to drive out a force of the enemy supposed to be between the Big Black and the Yazoo. The country was rich and full of supplies of both food and forage. Blair was instructed to take all of it. The cattle were to be driven in for the use of our army, and the food and forage to be consumed by our troops or destroyed by fire. All bridges were to be destroyed, and the road rendered as nearly impassable as possible. Blair went forty-five miles and was gone almost a week. His work was effectually done. I requested Porter at this time to send the Marine Brigade, a floating nondescript force, which had been assigned to his command and which proved very useful up to Haines's Bluff to hold it, until reinforcements could be sent. On the 26th, I also received a letter from Banks, asking me to reinforce him with 10,000 men at Port Hudson. Of course, I could not comply with his request, nor did I think he needed them. He was in no danger of an attack by the garrison in his front, and there was no army organizing in his rear to raise the siege. On the 3rd of June, a brigade from Hurlbut's command arrived, General Kimball commanding. It was sent to Mechanicsburg, some miles northeast of Haines's Bluff, and about midway between the Big Black and the Yazoo. A brigade of Blair's division and 1,200 cavalry had already, on Blair's return from the Yazoo, been sent to the same place with instructions to watch the crossings of the Big Black River, to destroy the roads in his, Blair's front, and to gather or destroy all supplies. On the 7th of June, our little force of colored and white troops across the Mississippi at Milliken's Bend were attacked by about 3,000 men from Richard Taylor's Trans-Mississippi Command. With the aid of the gunboats, they were speedily repelled. I sent Mower's brigade over 
with instructions to drive the enemy beyond the Tensus Bayou, and we had no further trouble in that quarter during the siege. This was the first important engagement of the war in which colored troops were under fire. These men were very raw, having all been enlisted since the beginning of the siege, but they behaved well. On the 8th of June, a full division arrived from Holbrook's command under General Suey Smith. It was sent immediately to Haines's Bluff, and General C. C. Washburn was assigned to the general command at that point. On the 11th, a strong division arrived from the Department of the Missouri under General Herron, which was placed on our left. This cut off the last possible chance of communication between Pemberton and Johnston, as it enabled Lawman to close up on McClernand's left, while Heron entrenched from Lawman to the water's edge. At this point, the water recedes a few hundred yards from the high land. Through this opening, no doubt, the Confederate commanders had been able to get messengers under cover of night. On the 14th, General Park arrived with two divisions of Burnside's Corps and was immediately dispatched to Haines's Bluff. These latter troops, Herons and Parks's, were the reinforcements already spoken of sent by Halleck in anticipation of their being needed. They arrived none too soon. I now had about 71,000 men. More than half were disposed across the peninsula between the Yazoo at Haines's Bluff and the Big Black, with a division of Osterhaus watching the crossings of the latter river further south and west from the crossing of the Jackson Road to Baldwin's Ferry and below. There were eight roads leading into Vicksburg, along which, and their immediate sides, our work was specially pushed and batteries advanced but no commanding point within range of the enemy was neglected on the seventeenth i received a letter from general sherman and one on the eighteenth from general mcpherson saying that their respective commands had complained to them of a fulsome congratulatory order published by general mcclernand to the thirteenth corps which did great injustice to the other troops engaged in the campaign this order had been sent north and published and now papers containing it had reached our camps the order had not been heard of by me and certainly not by troops outside of mcclernand's command until brought in this way i at once wrote to mcclernand directing him to send me a copy of this order he did so and i at once relieved him from the command of the thirteenth army corps and ordered him back to springfield illinois the publication of his order in the press was in violation of war department orders and also of mine end of section thirty seven recording by jim clevenger Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at JOCCLDV dot com. Eight of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant, Chapter 38, Johnston's Movements, Fortifications at Haines's Bluff, Explosion of the Mine, Explosion of the Second Mine, Preparing for the Assault, The Flag of Truce, Meeting with Pemberton, Negotiations for surrender, accepting the terms, surrender of Vicksburg. On the 22nd of June, positive information was received that Johnston had crossed the Big Black River for the purpose of attacking our rear 
to raise the siege and release Pemberton. The correspondence between Johnston and Pemberton shows that all expectation of holding Vicksburg had by this time passed from Johnston's mind. I immediately ordered Sherman to the command of all the forces from Haines's Bluff to the Big Black River. This amounted now to quite half the troops about Vicksburg. Besides these, Heron and A.J. Smith's divisions were ordered to hold themselves in readiness to reinforce Sherman. Haines's Bluff had been strongly fortified on the land side, and on all commanding points from there to the Big Black at the railroad crossing, batteries had been constructed. The work of connecting by rifle pits, where this was not already done, was an easy task for the troops that were to defend them. We were now looking west, besieging Pemberton, while we were also looking east to defend ourselves against an expected siege by Johnston. But as against the garrison of Vicksburg, we were as substantially protected as they were against us. Where we were looking east and north, we were strongly fortified, and on the defensive. Johnston evidently took in the situation, and wisely, I think, abstained from making an assault on us, because it would simply have inflicted loss on both sides without accomplishing any result. We were strong enough to have taken the offensive against him, but I did not feel disposed to take any risk of losing our hold upon Pemberton's army, while I would have rejoiced at the opportunity of defending ourselves against an attack by Johnston. From the 23rd of May, the work of fortifying and pushing forward our position nearer to the enemy had been steadily progressing. At three points on the Jackson Road, in front of Leggett's brigade, a sap was run up to the enemy's parapet, and by the 25th of June we had it undermined and the mine charged. The enemy had countermined, but did not succeed in reaching our mine. At this particular point the hill on which the rebel work stands rises abruptly. Our sap ran close up to the outside of the enemy's parapet. In fact, this parapet was also our protection. The soldiers of the two sides occasionally conversed pleasantly across this barrier. Sometimes they exchanged the hard bread of the Union soldiers for the tobacco of the Confederates. At other times, the enemy threw over hand grenades, and often our men catching them in their hands returned them. Our mine had been started some distance back down the hill. Consequently, when it had extended as far as the parapet, it was many feet below it. This caused the failure of the enemy in his search to find and destroy it. On the 25th of June, at 3 o'clock, all being ready, the mine was exploded. A heavy artillery fire all along the line had been ordered to open with the explosion. The effect was to blow the top of the hill off and make a crater where it stood. The breach was not sufficient to enable us to pass a column of attack through. In fact, the enemy, having failed to reach our mine, had thrown up a line further back where most of the men guarding that point were placed. There were a few men, however, left at the advance line, and others working in the countermine, which was still being pushed to find ours. All that were there were thrown into the air, some of them coming down on our side still alive. I remember one colored man who had been underground at work when the explosion took place, who was thrown to our side. He was not much hurt, but terribly frightened. Someone asked him how high he had gone up. Don't know, Massa, but think about three mile, was his reply. General Logan commanded at this point, and took this colored man to his quarters, where he did service to the end of the siege. As soon as the explosion took place, 
the crater was seized by two regiments of our troops who were nearby under cover where they had been placed for the express purpose the enemy made a desperate effort to expel them but failed and soon retired behind the new line from here however they threw hand grenades which did some execution the compliment was returned by our men but not with so much effect the enemy could lay their grenades on the parapet which alone divided the contestants and rolled them down upon us while from our side they had to be thrown over the parapet which was at considerable elevation during the night we made efforts to secure our position in the crater against the missiles of the enemy so as to run trenches along the outer base of their parapet right and left but the enemy continued throwing their grenades and brought boxes of field ammunition shells the fuses of which they would light with port fires and throw them by hand into our ranks we found it impossible to continue this work another mine was consequently started which was exploded on the first of july destroying an entire rebel redan killing and wounding a considerable number of its occupants and leaving an immense chasm where it stood no attempt to charge was made this time the experience of the twenty fifth admonishing us our loss in the first affair was about thirty killed and wounded the enemy must have lost more in the two explosions than we did in the first we lost none in the second from this time forward the work of mining and pushing our position nearer to the enemy was prosecuted with vigor and i determined to explode no more mines until we were ready to explode a number at different points and assault immediately after we were up now at three different points one in front of each corps to where only the parapet of the enemy divided us at this time an intercepted dispatch from johnston to pemberton informed me that johnston intended to make a determined attack upon us in order to relieve the garrison at vicksburg i knew the garrison would make no formidable effort to relieve itself the picket lines were so close to each other where there was space enough between the two lines to post pickets that the men could converse on the twenty first of june i was informed through this means that pemberton was preparing to escape by crossing to the louisiana side under cover of night that he had employed workmen in making boats for that purpose that the men had been canvassed to ascertain if they would make an assault on the yankees to cut their way out but they had refused and almost mutinied because their commander would not surrender and relieve their suffering and had only been pacified by the assurance that boats enough would be finished in a week to carry them all over the rebel pickets also said that houses in the city had been pulled down to get material to build these boats with afterwards this story was verified on entering the city we found a large number of very rudely constructed boats all necessary steps were at once taken to render such an attempt abortive our pickets were doubled admiral porter was notified so that the river might be more closely watched material was collected on the west bank of the river to be set on fire and light up the river if the attempt was made and batteries were established along the levee crossing the peninsula on the louisiana side had the attempt been made the garrison of vicksburg would have been drowned or made prisoners on the louisiana side general richard taylor was expected on the west bank to cooperate in this movement i believe but he did not come nor could he have done so with a force sufficient to be of service the mississippi was now in our possession from its source to its mouth except in the immediate front of vicksburg and of port hudson we had nearly exhausted the country along a line drawn from lake providence to opposite bruinsburg 
the roads west were not of a character to draw supplies over for any considerable force by the first of july our approaches had reached the enemy's ditch at a number of places at ten points we could move under cover to within from five to one hundred yards of the enemy orders were given to make all preparations for assault on the sixth of july the debauches were ordered widened to afford easy egress while the approaches were also to be widened to admit the troops to pass through four abreast plank and bags filled with cotton packed in tightly were ordered prepared to enable the troops to cross the ditches on the night of the first of july johnston was between brownsville and the big black and wrote pemberton from there that about the seventh of the month an attempt would be made to create a diversion to enable him to cut his way out pemberton was a prisoner before this message reached him on july first pemberton seeing no hope of outside relief addressed the following letter to each of his four division commanders unless the siege of vicksburg is raised or supplies are thrown in it will become necessary very shortly to evacuate the place i see no prospect of the former and there are many great if not insuperable obstacles in the way of the latter you are therefore requested to inform me with as little delay as possible as to the condition of your troops and their ability to make the marches and undergo the fatigues necessary to accomplish a successful evacuation two of his generals suggested surrender and the other two practically did the same they expressed the opinion that an attempt to evacuate would fail pemberton had previously got a message to johnston suggesting that he should try to negotiate with me for a release of the garrison with their arms johnston replied that it would be a confession of weakness for him to do so but he authorized pemberton to use his name in making such an arrangement on the third about ten o'clock a m white flags appeared on a portion of the rebel works hostilities along that part of the line ceased at once soon two persons were seen coming towards our lines bearing a white flag they proved to be general bowen a division commander and colonel montgomery aide-de-camp to pemberton bearing the following letter to me i have the honor to propose an armistice for ours with the view to arranging terms for the capitulation of vicksburg to this end if agreeable to you i will appoint three commissioners to meet a like number to be named by yourself at such place and hour to-day as you may find convenient i make this proposition to save the further effusion of blood which must otherwise be shed to a frightful extent feeling myself fully able to maintain my position for a yet indefinite period this communication will be handed you under a flag of truce by major general john s bowen it was a glorious sight to officers and soldiers on the line where these white flags were visible and the news soon spread to all parts of the command the troops felt that their long and weary marches hard fighting ceaseless watching by night and day in a hot climate exposure to all sorts of weather to diseases and worst of all to the jibes of many northern papers that came to them saying all their suffering was in vain that vicksburg would never be taken were at last at an end and the union sure to be saved bowen was received by general a j smith and asked to see me i had been a neighbor of bowen's in missouri and knew him well and favorably before the war but his request was refused 
He then suggested that I should meet Pemberton. To this I sent a verbal message saying that, if Pemberton desired it, I would meet him in front of McPherson's corps at three o'clock that afternoon. I also sent the following written reply to Pemberton's letter. Your note of this date is just received proposing an armistice for several hours for the purpose of arranging terms of capitulation through commissioners to be appointed, etc. The useless effusion of blood you propose stopping by this course can be ended at any time you may choose by the unconditional surrender of the city and garrison. Men who have shown so much endurance and courage as those now in vicksburg will always challenge the respect of an adversary and i can assure you will be treated with all the respect due to prisoners of war i do not favor the proposition of appointing commissioners to arrange the terms of capitulation because i have no terms other than those indicated above at three o'clock Pemberton appeared at the point suggested in my verbal message, accompanied by the same officers who had borne his letter of the morning. Generals Ord, McPherson, Logan, and A.J. Smith, and several officers of my staff accompanied me. Our place of meeting was on a hillside within a few hundred feet of the rebel lines nearby stood a stunted oak tree which was made historical by the event it was but a short time before the last vestige of its body root and limb had disappeared the fragments taken as trophies since then the same tree has furnished as many cords of wood in the shape of trophies as the true cross Pemberton and I had served in the same division during part of the Mexican War. I knew him very well, therefore, and greeted him as an old acquaintance. He soon asked what terms I proposed to give his army if it surrendered. My answer was the same as proposed in my reply to his letter. Pemberton then said rather snappishly, the conference might as well end and turned abruptly as if to leave. I said, very well. General Bowen, I saw, was very anxious that the surrender should be consummated. His manner and remarks while Pemberton and I were talking showed this. He now proposed that he and one of our generals should have a conference. I had no objection to this, as nothing could be made binding upon me that they might propose. Smith and Bowen, accordingly, had a conference, during which Pemberton and I, moving a short distance away towards the enemy's lines, were in conversation. After a while, Bowen suggested that the Confederate Army should be allowed to march out with the honors of war, carrying their small arms and field artillery. This was promptly and unceremoniously rejected. The interview here ended i agreeing however to send a letter giving final terms by ten o'clock that night word was sent to admiral porter soon after the correspondence with pemberton commenced so that hostilities might be stopped on the part of both army and navy it was agreed on my paging with pemberton that they should not be renewed until our correspondence ceased when I returned to my headquarters, I sent for all the corps and division commanders with the army immediately confronting Vicksburg. Half the army was from eight to twelve miles off, waiting for Johnston. I informed them of the contents of Pemberton's letters, of my reply, and the substance of the interview, and that I was ready to hear any suggestion but would hold the power of deciding entirely in my own hands. This was the nearest approach to a council of war I ever held. Against the general and almost unanimous judgment of the council, 
I sent the following letter. In conformity with agreement of this afternoon, I will submit the following proposition for the surrender of the city of Vicksburg, public stores, etc. On your accepting the terms proposed, I will march in one division as a guard and take possession at 8 a.m. tomorrow. As soon as rolls can be made out and paroles be signed by officers and men, you will be allowed to march out of our lines, the officers taking with them their side arms and clothing, and the field, staff, and cavalry officers one horse each. The rank and file will be allowed all their clothing, but no other property. If these conditions are accepted, any amount of rations you may deem necessary can be taken from the stores you now have, and also the necessary cooking utensils for preparing them. Thirty wagons also, counting two, two horse or mule teams as one, will be allowed to transport such articles as cannot be carried along. The same conditions will be allowed to all sick and wounded officers and soldiers as fast as they become able to travel. The paroles for these latter must be signed, however, whilst officers present are authorized to sign the roll of prisoners. By the terms of the cartel then in force, prisoners captured by either army were required to be forwarded as soon as possible to either Aikenson's Landing below Dutch Gap on the James River or to Vicksburg, there to be exchanged or paroled until they could be exchanged. There was a Confederate commissioner at Vicksburg authorized to make the exchange. I did not propose to take him a prisoner, but to leave him free to perform the functions of his office. Had I insisted upon an unconditional surrender, there would have been over 30,000 men to transport to Cairo, very much to the inconvenience of the army on the Mississippi. Thence the prisoners would have had to be transported by rail to Washington or Baltimore, thence again by steamer to Aikens's, all at very great expense. At Aikens's they would have had to be paroled, because the Confederates did not have Union prisoners to give in exchange. Then again, Pemberton's army was largely composed of men whose homes were in the southwest. I knew many of them were tired of the war, and would get home just as soon as they could. A large number of them had voluntarily come into our lines during the siege, and requested to be sent north, where they could get employment until the war was over, and they could go to their homes. Late at night, I received the following reply to my last letter. I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication of this date, proposing terms of capitulation for this garrison and post. In the main, your terms are accepted, but, in justice both to the honor and spirit of my troops, manifested in the defense of Vicksburg, I have to submit the following amendments, which, if acceded to by you, will perfect the agreement between us. At 10 o'clock a.m. tomorrow, I propose to evacuate the works in and around Vicksburg and to surrender the city and garrison under my command by marching out with my colors and arms, stacking them in front of my present lines, after which you will take possession. Officers to retain their side arms and personal property and the rights and property of citizens to be respected. This was received after midnight. My reply was as follows. I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication of 3rd July. The amendment proposed by you cannot be acceded to in full. It will be necessary to furnish every officer and man, 
with a parole signed by himself which with the completion of the roll of prisoners will necessarily take some time again i can make no stipulations with regard to the treatment of citizens and their private property while i do not propose to cause them any undue annoyance or loss i cannot consent to leave myself under any restraint by stipulations the property which officers will be allowed to take with them will be as stated in my proposition of last evening that is officers will be allowed their private baggage and side arms and mounted officers one horse each if you mean by your proposition for each brigade to march to the front of the lines now occupied by it and stack arms at ten o'clock a m and then return to the inside and there remain as prisoners until properly paroled i will make no objection to it should no notification be received of your acceptance of my terms by nine o'clock a m i shall regard them as having been rejected and shall act accordingly should these terms be accepted white flags should be displayed along your lines to prevent such of my troops as may not have been notified from firing upon your men pemberton promptly accepted these terms during the siege there had been a good deal of friendly sparring between the soldiers of the two armies on picket and where the lines were close together all rebels were known as johnnies all union troops as yanks often johnny would call well yank when are you coming into town the reply was sometimes we propose to celebrate the fourth of july there sometimes it would be we always treat our prisoners with kindness and do not want to hurt them or we are holding you as prisoners of war while you are feeding yourselves the garrison from the commanding general down undoubtedly expected an assault on the fourth they knew from the temper of their men it would be successful when made and that would be a greater humiliation than to surrender besides it would be attended with severe loss to them the vicksburg paper which we received regularly through the courtesy of the rebel pickets said prior to the fourth in speaking of the yankee boast that they would take dinner in vicksburg that day that the best recipe for cooking a rabbit was first catch your rabbit the paper at this time and for some time previous was printed on the plain side of wallpaper the last number was issued on the fourth and announced that we had caught our rabbit i have no doubt that pemberton commenced his correspondence on the third with a twofold purpose first to avoid an assault which he knew would be successful and second to prevent the capture taking place on the great national holiday the anniversary of the declaration of american independence holding out for better terms as he did he defeated his aim in the latter particular at the appointed hour the garrison of vicksburg marched out of their works and formed line in front stacked arms and marched back in good order our whole army present witnessed this scene without cheering Logan's division, which had approached nearest the rebel works, was the first to march in, and the flag of one of the regiments of his division was soon floating over the courthouse. Our soldiers were no sooner inside the lines than the two armies began to fraternize. Our men had had full rations from the time the siege commenced to the close. The enemy had been suffering particularly towards the last i myself saw our men taking bread from their haversacks and giving it to the enemy they had so recently been engaged in starving out it was accepted with avidity and with thanks pemberton says in his report if it should be asked 
why the fourth of july was selected as the day for surrender the answer is obvious i believed that upon that day i should obtain better terms well aware of the vanity of our foe i knew they would attach vast importance to the entrance on the fourth of july into the stronghold of the great river and that to gratify their national vanity they would yield then what could not be extorted from them at any other time this does not support my view of his reasons for selecting the day he did for surrendering but it must be recollected that his first letter asking terms was received about ten o'clock a m july third it then could hardly be expected that it would take twenty-four hours to effect a surrender he knew that johnston was in our rear for the purpose of raising the siege and he naturally would want to hold out as long as he could he knew his men would not resist an assault and one was expected on the fourth in our interview he told me he had rations enough to hold out for some time my recollection is two weeks it was this statement that induced me to insert in the terms that he was to draw rations for his men from his own supplies on the fourth of july general holmes with an army of eight or nine thousand men belonging to the trans mississippi department made an attack upon helena arkansas he was totally defeated by general prentice who was holding helena with less than forty two hundred soldiers holmes reported his loss at one thousand six hundred thirty six of which one hundred seventy three were killed but as prentice buried four hundred holmes evidently understated his losses the union loss was fifty seven killed one hundred twenty seven wounded and between thirty and forty missing this was the last effort on the part of the confederacy to raise the siege of vicksburg on the third as soon as negotiations were commenced i notified sherman and directed him to be ready to take the offensive against johnston drive him out of the state and destroy his army if he could steel and ord were directed at the same time to be in readiness to join sherman as soon as a surrender took place of this sherman was notified i rode into vicksburg with the troops and went to the river to exchange congratulations with the navy upon our joint victory at that time i found that many of the citizens had been living underground the ridges upon which vicksburg is built and those back to the big black are composed of a deep yellow clay of great tenacity where roads and streets are cut through perpendicular banks are left and stand as well as if composed of stone the magazines of the enemy were made by running passageways into this clay at places where there were deep cuts many citizens secured places of safety for their families by carving out rooms in these embankments a doorway in these cases would be cut in a high bank starting from the level of the road or street and after running in a few feet a room of the size required was carved out of the clay the dirt being removed by the doorway in some instances i saw where two rooms were cut out for a single family with a doorway and the clay wall separating them some of these were carpeted and furnished with considerable elaboration in these the occupants were fully secure from the shells of the navy which were dropped into the city night and day without intermission i returned to my old headquarters outside in the afternoon and did not move into the town until the sixth on the afternoon of the fourth i sent captain william m dunn of my staff to cairo the nearest point where the telegraph could be reached 
with a dispatch to the general-in-chief it was as follows the enemy surrendered this morning the only terms allowed is their parole as prisoners of war this i regard as a great advantage to us at this moment it saves probably several days in the capture and leaves troops and transports ready for immediate service sherman with a large force moves immediately on johnston to drive him from the state i will send troops to the relief of banks and return the ninth army corps to burnside this news with the victory at gettysburg won the same day lifted a great load of anxiety from the minds of the president his cabinet and the loyal people all over the north the fate of the confederacy was sealed when vicksburg fell much hard fighting was to be done afterwards and many precious lives were to be sacrificed but the morale was with the supporters of the union ever after i at the same time wrote to general banks informing him of the fall and sending him a copy of the terms also saying i would send him all the troops he wanted to ensure the capture of the only foothold the enemy now had on the mississippi river general banks had a number of copies of this letter printed or at least a synopsis of it and very soon a copy fell into the hands of general gardner who was then in command of port hudson gardner at once sent a letter to the commander of the national forces saying that he had been informed of the surrender of vicksburg and telling how the information reached him he added that if this was true it was useless for him to hold out longer general banks gave him assurances that vicksburg had been surrendered and general gardner surrendered unconditionally on the ninth of july port hudson with nearly six thousand prisoners fifty-one guns five thousand small arms and other stores fell into the hands of the union forces from that day to the close of the rebellion the mississippi river from its source to its mouth remained in the control of the national troops pemberton and his army were kept in vicksburg until the whole could be paroled the paroles were in duplicate by organization one copy for each federals and confederates and signed by the commanding officers of the companies or regiments duplicates were also made for each soldier and signed by each individual one to be retained by the soldier signing and one to be retained by us several hundred refused to sign their paroles preferring to be sent to the north as prisoners to being sent back to fight again others again kept out of the way hoping to escape either alternative pemberton appealed to me in person to compel these men to sign their paroles but i declined it also leaked out that many of the men who had signed their paroles intended to desert and go to their homes as soon as they got out of our lines pemberton hearing this again appealed to me to assist him he wanted arms for a battalion to act as guards in keeping his men together while being marched to a camp of instruction where he expected to keep them until exchanged this request was also declined it was precisely what i expected and hoped that they would do i told him however that i would see that they marched beyond our lines in good order by the eleventh just one week after the surrender the paroles were completed and the confederate garrison marched out many deserted and fewer of them were ever returned to the ranks to fight again than would have been the case had the surrender been unconditional and the prisoners sent to the james river to be paroled as soon as our troops took possession of the city 
guards were established along the whole line of parapet from the river above to the river below the prisoners were allowed to occupy their old camps behind the entrenchments no restraint was put upon them except by their own commanders they were rationed about as our own men and from our supplies the men of the two armies fraternized as if they had been fighting for the same cause when they passed out of the works they had so long and so gallantly defended between lines of their late antagonists not a cheer went up not a remark was made that would give pain really i believe there was a feeling of sadness just then in the breast of most of the union soldiers at seeing the dejection of their late antagonists the day before the departure the following order was issued paroled prisoners will be sent out of here tomorrow they will be authorized to cross at the railroad bridge and move from there to edwards's ferry and on by way of raymond instruct the commands to be orderly and quiet as these prisoners pass to make no offensive remarks and not to harbor any who fall out of ranks after they have passed end of section thirty eight recorded by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com section thirty nine of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 39. Retrospect of the Campaign. Sherman's Movements. Proposed Movement Upon Mobile a painful accident ordered to report at cairo the capture of vicksburg with its garrison ordnance and ordnance stores and the successful battles fought in reaching them gave new spirit to the loyal people of the north new hopes for the final success of the cause of the union were inspired the victory gained at gettysburg upon the same day added to their hopes now the mississippi river was entirely in the possession of the national troops for the fall of vicksburg gave us port hudson at once the army of northern virginia was driven out of pennsylvania and forced back to about the same ground it occupied in eighteen sixty one the army of the tennessee united with the army of the gulf dividing the confederate states completely the first dispatch i received from the government after the fall of vicksburg was in these words i fear your paroling the prisoners at vicksburg without actual delivery to a proper agent as required by the seventh article of the cartel may be construed into an absolute release and that the men will immediately be placed in the ranks of the enemy such has been the case elsewhere if these prisoners have not been allowed to depart you will detain them until further orders halleck did not know that they had already been delivered into the hands of major watts confederate commissioner for the exchange of prisoners at vicksburg thirty one thousand six hundred prisoners were surrendered together with one hundred seventy two cannon about sixty thousand muskets and a large amount of ammunition the small arms of the enemy were far superior to the bulk of ours up to this time our troops at the west had been limited to the old United States flintlock muskets changed into percussion. 
or the Belgium musket, imported early in the war, almost as dangerous to the person firing it as to the one aimed at, and a few new and improved arms. These were of many different calibers, a fact that caused much trouble in distributing ammunition during an engagement. The enemy had generally new arms, which had run the blockade and were of uniform caliber. After the surrender, I authorized all colonels, whose regiments were armed with inferior muskets, to place them in the stack of captured arms and replace them with the latter. A large number of arms turned in to the Ordnance Department as captured were thus arms that had really been used by the Union Army in the capture of Vicksburg. In this narrative, I have not made the mention I should like of officers, dead and alive, whose services entitled them to special mention. Neither have I made that mention of the Navy which its services deserve. Suffice it to say, the close of the siege of Vicksburg found us with an army unsurpassed in proportion to its numbers, taken as a whole of officers and men. A military education was acquired which no other school could have given. Men who thought a company was quite enough for them to command properly at the beginning would have made good regimental or brigade commanders. Most of the brigade commanders were equal to the command of a division, and one, Ransom, would have been equal to the command of a corps at least. Logan and Crocker ended the campaign fitted to command independent armies. General F. P. Blair joined me at Milliken's Bend, a full-fledged general, without having served in a lower grade. He commanded a division in the campaign. I had known Blair in Missouri, where I had voted against him in 1858 when he ran for Congress. I knew him as a frank, positive, and generous man, true to his friends, even to a fault, but always a leader. I dreaded his coming. I knew from experience that it was more difficult to command two generals desiring to be leaders than it was to command one army officered intelligently and with subordination. It affords me the greatest pleasure to record now my agreeable disappointment in respect to his character. There was no man braver than he, nor was there any who obeyed all orders of his superior in rank with more unquestioning alacrity. He was one man as a soldier, another as a politician. The Navy under Porter was all it could be during the entire campaign. Without its assistance, the campaign could not have been successfully made with twice the number of men engaged. It could not have been made at all, in the way it was, with any number of men without such assistance. The most perfect harmony reigned between the two arms of the service. There never was a request made, that I am aware of, either of the flag officer or any of his subordinates, that was not promptly complied with. The campaign of Vicksburg was suggested and developed by circumstances. The election of 1862 had gone against the prosecution of the war. Voluntary enlistments had nearly ceased, and the draft had been resorted to. This was resisted, and a defeat or backward movement would have made its execution impossible. A forward movement to a decisive victory was necessary. Accordingly, I resolved to get below Vicksburg, unite with Banks against Port Hudson, make New Orleans a base, and with that base and Grand Gulf as a starting point, move our combined forces against Vicksburg. Upon reaching Grand Gulf, after running its batteries and fighting a battle, 
I received a letter from Banks informing me that he could not be at Port Hudson under ten days, and then with only 15,000 men. The time was worth more than the reinforcements. I therefore determined to push into the interior of the enemy's country. With a large river behind us, held above and below by the enemy, rapid movements were essential to success. Jackson was captured the day after a new commander had arrived, and only a few days before large reinforcements were expected. A rapid movement west was made. The garrison of Vicksburg was met in two engagements, and badly defeated, and driven back into its stronghold, and there successfully besieged. It looks now as though Providence had directed the course of the campaign while the Army of the Tennessee executed the decree. Upon the surrender of the garrison of Vicksburg, there were three things that required immediate attention. The first was to send a force to drive the enemy from our rear and out of the state. The second was to send reinforcements to banks near Port Hudson, if necessary, to complete the triumph of opening the Mississippi from its source to its mouth to the free navigation of vessels bearing the stars and stripes. The third was to inform the authorities at Washington and the North of the good news, to relieve their long suspense and strengthen their confidence in the ultimate success of the cause they had so much at heart. Soon after negotiations were opened with General Pemberton for the surrender of the city, I notified Sherman, whose troops extended from Haines's Bluff on the left to the crossing of the Vicksburg and Jackson Road over the Big Black on the right, and directed him to hold his command in readiness to advance and drive the enemy from the state as soon as Vicksburg surrendered. Steele and Ord were directed to be in readiness to join Sherman in his move against General Johnston, and Sherman was advised of this also. Sherman moved promptly, crossing the Big Black at three different points with as many columns, all concentrating at Bolton, twenty miles west of Jackson. Johnston heard of the surrender of Vicksburg almost as soon as it occurred, and immediately fell back on Jackson. On the 8th of July, Sherman was within ten miles of Jackson, and on the 11th was close up to the defenses of the city, and shelling the town. The siege was kept up until the morning of the 17th, when it was found that the enemy had evacuated during the night. The weather was very hot, the roads dusty, and the water bad. Johnston destroyed the roads as he passed, and had so much the start that pursuit was useless. But Sherman sent one division, Steele's, to Brandon, fourteen miles east of Jackson. The national loss in the second capture of Jackson was less than 1,000 men killed, wounded, and missing. The Confederate loss was probably less, except in captured. More than this number fell into our hands as prisoners. Medicines and food were left for the Confederate wounded and sick who had to be left behind. A large amount of rations was issued to the families that remained in Jackson. Medicine and food were also sent to Raymond for the destitute families as well as the sick and wounded, as I thought it only fair that we should return to these people some of the articles we had taken while marching through the country. I wrote to Sherman, Impress upon the men the importance of going through the state in an orderly manner, abstaining from taking anything not absolutely necessary for their subsistence while traveling. They should try to create as favorable an impression as possible upon the people. Provisions and forage, when called for by them, were issued to all the people from Bruinsburg to Jackson and back to Vicksburg, 
whose resources had been taken for the supply of our army. Very large quantities of groceries and provisions were so issued. Sherman was ordered back to Vicksburg, and his troops took much the same position they had occupied before, from the Big Black to Haines's Bluff, having cleaned up about Vicksburg and captured or routed all regular Confederate forces for more than a hundred miles in all directions, I felt that the troops that had done so much should be allowed to do more before the enemy could recover from the blow he had received, and, while important points, might be captured without bloodshed. I suggested to the General-in-Chief the idea of a campaign against Mobile, starting from Lake Pontchartrain. Halleck preferred another course. The possession of the Trans-Mississippi by the Union forces seemed to possess more importance in his mind than almost any campaign east of the Mississippi. I am well aware that the President was very anxious to have a foothold in Texas, to stop the clamor of some of the foreign governments, which seemed to be seeking a pretext to interfere in the war, at least so far as to recognize belligerent rights to the Confederate States. This, however, could have been easily done without wasting troops in western Louisiana and eastern Texas by sending a garrison at once to Brownsville on the Rio Grande. Halleck disapproved of my proposition to go against Mobile, so that I was obliged to settle down and see myself put again on the defensive as I had been a year before in West Tennessee. It would have been an easy thing to capture Mobile at the time I proposed to go there, having that as a base of operations. Troops could have been thrown into the interior to operate against General Bragg's army. This would necessarily have compelled Bragg to detach in order to meet this fire in his rear. If he had not done this, the troops from Mobile could have inflicted inestimable damage upon much of the country from which his army and Lee's were yet receiving their supplies. I was so much impressed with this idea that I renewed my request later in July and again about the 1st of August and proposed sending all the troops necessary, asking only the assistance of the Navy to protect the debarkation of troops at or near Mobile. I also asked for a leave of absence to visit New Orleans, particularly if my suggestion to move against Mobile should be approved. Both requests were refused. So far as my experience with General Halleck went, it was very much easier for him to refuse a favor than to grant one. But I did not regard this as a favor. It was simply in line of duty, though, out of my department, the general-in-chief, having decided against me, the depletion of an army which had won a succession of great victories commenced, as had been the case the year before, after the fall of Corinth, when the army was sent where it would do the least good. By orders, I sent to Banks a force of 4,000 men, returned the Ninth Corps to Kentucky, and, when transportation had been collected, started a division of 5,000 men to Schofield in Missouri, where Price was raiding the state. I also detached a brigade under Ransom to Natchez, to garrison that place permanently. This latter move was quite fortunate, as to the time when Ransom arrived there. The enemy happened to have a large number, about 5,000 head, of beef cattle there on the way from Texas to feed the eastern armies, and also a large amount of munitions of war which had probably come through Texas from the Rio Grande, and which were on the way to Lee's and other armies in the east. The troops that were left with me around Vicksburg were very busily and unpleasantly employed in making expeditions against guerrilla bands and small detachments of cavalry 
which infested the interior and in destroying mills bridges and rolling stock on the railroads the guerrillas and cavalry were not there to fight but to annoy and therefore disappeared on the first approach of our troops the country back of vicksburg was filled with deserters from pemberton's army and it was reported many from johnston's also the men determined not to fight again while the war lasted those who lived beyond the reach of the confederate army wanted to get to their homes those who did not wanted to get north where they could work for their support till the war was over besides all this there was quite a peace feeling for the time being among the citizens of that part of mississippi but this feeling soon subsided it is not probable that pemberton got off with more than four thousand of his army to the camp where he proposed taking them and these were in a demoralized condition on the seventh of august i further depleted my army by sending the thirteenth corps general ord commanding to banks besides this i received orders to cooperate with the latter general in movements west of the mississippi having received this order i went to new orleans to confer with banks about the proposed movement all these movements came to naught during this visit i reviewed banks's army a short distance above carrollton the horse i rode was vicious and but little used and on my return to new orleans ran away and shying at a locomotive in the street fell probably on me i was rendered insensible and when i regained consciousness i found myself in a hotel near by with several doctors attending me my leg was swollen from the knee to the thigh and the swelling almost to the point of bursting extended along the body up to the armpit the pain was almost beyond endurance i lay at the hotel something over a week without being able to turn myself in bed i had a steamer stop at the nearest point possible and was carried to it on a litter i was then taken to vicksburg where i remained unable to move for some time afterwards while i was absent general sherman declined to assume command because he said it would confuse the records but he let all the orders be made in my name and was glad to render any assistance he could no orders were issued by my staff certainly no important orders except upon consultation with and approval of sherman on the thirteenth of september while i was still in new orleans halleck telegraphed to me to send all available forces to memphis and thence to tuscumbia to cooperate with rosecrans for the relief of chattanooga on the fifteenth he telegraphed again for all available forces to go to rosecrans this was received on the twenty seventh i was still confined to my bed unable to rise from it without assistance but i at once ordered sherman to send one division to memphis as fast as transports could be provided the division of mcpherson's corps which had got off and was on the way to join steele in arkansas was recalled and sent likewise to report to hurlbut at memphis hurlbut was directed to forward these two divisions with two others from his own corps at once and also to send any other troops that might be returning there halleck suggested that some good man like sherman or mcpherson should be sent to memphis to take charge of the troops going east on this i sent sherman as being i thought the most suitable person for an independent command and besides he was entitled to it if it had to be given to any one he was directed to take with him another division of his corps this left one back but having one of mcpherson's divisions he had still the equivalent before the receipt by me of these orders the battle of chickamauga 
had been fought and Rosecrans forced back into Chattanooga. The administration, as well as the general-in-chief, was nearly frantic at the situation of affairs there. Mr. Charles A. Dana, an officer of the War Department, was sent to Rosecrans' headquarters. I do not know what his instructions were, but he was still in Chattanooga when I arrived there at a later period. It seems that Halleck suggested that I should go to Nashville as soon as able to move, and take general direction of the troops moving from the west. I received the following dispatch, dated October 3rd. It is the wish of the Secretary of War that as soon as General Grant is able, he will come to Cairo and report by telegraph. I was still very lame, but started without delay. Arriving at Columbus on the 16th, I reported by telegraph. Your dispatch from Cairo of the 3rd directing me to report from Cairo was received at 11.30 on the 10th. Left the same day with staff and headquarters and am here en route for Cairo. End of Volume 1 End of Section 39 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Volume 2. Chapter 40. First meeting with Secretary Stanton. General Rosecrans. Commanding Military Division of Mississippi. Andrew Johnson's Address. Arrival at Chattanooga. The Reply. To my telegram of October 16, 1863, from Cairo, announcing my arrival at that point, came on the morning of the 17th, directing me to proceed immediately to the Galt House, Louisville, where I would meet an officer of the War Department with my instructions. I left Cairo within an hour or two after the receipt of this dispatch, going by rail via Indianapolis, just as the train I was on was starting out of the depot at Indianapolis, a messenger came running up to stop it, saying the Secretary of War was coming into the station and wanted to see me. I had never met Mr. Stanton up to that time, although we had held frequent conversations over the wires the year before when I was in Tennessee. Occasionally at night, he would order the wires between the War Department and my headquarters to be connected, and we would hold a conversation for an hour or two. On this occasion, the Secretary was accompanied by Governor Brow of Ohio, whom I had never met, though he and my father had been old acquaintances. Mr. Stanton dismissed the special train that had brought him to Indianapolis and accompanied me to Louisville. Up to this time, no hint had been given me of what was wanted after I left Vicksburg, except the suggestion in one of Halleck's dispatches that I had better go to Nashville and superintend the operation of troops sent to relieve Rosecrans. Soon after we started, the secretary handed me two orders, saying that I might take my choice of them. The two were identical in all but one particular. Both created the Military Division of Mississippi, giving me the command, composed of the departments of the Ohio, the Cumberland, and the Tennessee, and all the territory from the Alleghenies to the Mississippi River, north of Banks's command in the southwest. One order left the department commanders as they were, 
while the other relieved Rosecrans and assigned Thomas to his place. I accepted the latter. We reached Louisville after night, and, if I remember rightly, in a cold, drizzling rain. The Secretary of War told me afterwards that he caught a cold on that occasion from which he never expected to recover. He never did. A day was spent in Louisville the secretary giving me the military news at the capital and talking about the disappointment at the results of some of the campaigns by the evening of the day after our arrival all matters of discussion seemed exhausted and i left the hotel to spend the evening away both mrs grant who was with me and myself having relatives living in louisville in the course of the evening, Mr. Stanton received a dispatch from Mr. C. A. Dana, then in Chattanooga, informing him that, unless prevented, Rosecrans would retreat, and advising peremptory orders against his doing so. As stated before, after the fall of Vicksburg, I urged strongly upon the government the propriety of a movement against mobile general rosecrans had been at murfreesboro tennessee with a large and well-equipped army from early in the year eighteen sixty three with bragg confronting him with a force quite equal to his own at first considering it was on the defensive but after the investment of vicksburg Bragg's army was largely depleted to strengthen Johnston in Mississippi, who was being reinforced to raise the siege. I frequently wrote General Halleck suggesting that Rosecrans should move against Bragg. By so doing, he would either detain the latter's troops where they were, or lay Chattanooga open to capture. General Halleck strongly approved the suggestion and finally wrote me that he had repeatedly ordered rosecrans to advance but that the latter had constantly failed to comply with the order and at last after having held a council of war had replied in effect that it was a military maxim not to fight two decisive battles at the same time if true the maxim was not applicable in this case it would be bad to be defeated in two decisive battles fought the same day, but it would not be bad to win them. I, however, was fighting no battle, and the siege of Vicksburg had drawn from Rosecrans's front so many of the enemy that his chances of victory were much greater than they would be if he waited until the siege was over when these troops could be returned rosecrans was ordered to move against the army that was detaching troops to raise the siege finally he did move on the twenty fourth of june but ten days afterwards vicksburg surrendered and the troops sent from bragg were free to return it was at this time that i recommended to the general-in-chief the movement against mobile i knew the peril the army of the cumberland was in being depleted continually not only by ordinary casualties but also by having to detach troops to hold its constantly extending line over which to draw supplies while the enemy in front was as constantly being strengthened Mobile was important to the enemy, and in the absence of a threatening force was guarded by little else than artillery. If threatened by land and from the water at the same time, the prize would fall easily, or troops would have to be sent to its defense. Those troops would necessarily come from Bragg. My judgment was overruled, and the troops under my command were dissipated over other parts of the country where it was thought they could render the most service. Soon it was discovered in Washington that Rosecrans was in trouble and required assistance. The emergency was now too immediate to allow us to give this assistance by making an attack in rear of Bragg upon Mobile. 
It was therefore necessary to reinforce directly, and troops were sent from every available point. Rosecrans had very skillfully maneuvered Bragg south of the Tennessee River and through and beyond Chattanooga. If he had stopped and entrenched and made himself strong there, all would have been right and the mistake of not moving earlier partially compensated. But he pushed on, with his forces very much scattered, until Bragg's troops from Mississippi began to join him. Then Bragg took the initiative, Rosecrans had to fall back in turn, and was able to get his army together at Chickamauga, some miles southeast of Chattanooga, before the main battle was brought on. The battle was fought on the 19th and 20th of September, and Rosecrans was badly defeated, with a heavy loss in artillery and some 16,000 men killed, wounded, and captured. The Corps, under Major General George H. Thomas, stood its ground, while Rosecrans, with Crittenden and McCook, returned to Chattanooga. Thomas returned also, but later, and with his troops in good order. Bragg followed and took possession of Missionary Ridge, overlooking Chattanooga. He also occupied Lookout Mountain, west of the town, which Rosecrans had abandoned, and with it his control of the river and the river road as far back as Bridgeport. The national troops were now strongly entrenched in Chattanooga Valley, with the Tennessee River behind them and the enemy occupying commanding heights to the east and west with a strong line across the valley from mountain to mountain and with Chattanooga Creek, for a large part of the way, in front of their line. On the 29th, Halleck telegraphed me, the above results and directed all the forces that could be spared from my department to be sent to rosecrans long before this dispatch was received sherman was on his way and mcpherson was moving east with most of the garrison of vicksburg a retreat at that time would have been a terrible disaster it would not only have been the loss of a most important strategic position to us but it would have been attended with the loss of all the artillery still left with the Army of the Cumberland, and the annihilation of that army itself, either by capture or demoralization. All supplies for Rosecrans had to be brought from Nashville. The railroad between this base and the army was in possession of the government up to Bridgeport, the point at which the road crosses to the south side of the Tennessee River, but Bragg, holding Lookout and Raccoon Mountains west of Chattanooga, commanded the railroad, the river, and the shortest and best wagon roads, both south and north of the Tennessee, between Chattanooga and Bridgeport. The distance between these two places is but 26 miles by rail, but owing to the position of Bragg, all supplies for Rosecrans had to be hauled by a circuitous route north of the river and over a mountainous country, increasing the distance to over sixty miles. This country afforded but little food for his animals, nearly ten thousand of which had already starved and not enough were left to draw a single piece of artillery or even the ambulances to convey the sick. The men had been on half rations of hard bread for a considerable time, with but few other supplies except beef driven from Nashville across the country. The region along the road became so exhausted of food for the cattle that by the time they reached Chattanooga they were much in the condition of the few animals left alive there on the lift. Indeed, the beef was so poor that the soldiers were in the habit of saying, with a faint fastidiousness, that they were living on half rations of hard bread and beef dried on the hoof. Chapter 7
nothing could be transported but food and the troops were without sufficient shoes or other clothing suitable for the advancing season what they had was well worn the fuel within the federal lines was exhausted even to the stumps of trees there were no teams to draw it from the opposite bank where it was abundant the only way of supplying fuel for some time before my arrival had been to cut trees on the north bank of the river at a considerable distance up the stream form rafts of it and float it down with the current affecting a landing on the south side within our lines by the use of paddles or poles it would then be carried on the shoulders of the men to their camps if a retreat had occurred at this time it is not probable that any of the army would have reached the railroad as an organized body if followed by the enemy on the receipt of mr dana's dispatch mr stanton sent for me finding that i was out he became nervous and excited inquiring of every person he met including guests of the house whether they knew where i was and bidding them find me and send me to him at once about eleven o'clock i returned to the hotel and on my way when near the house every person met was a messenger from the secretary apparently partaking of his impatience to see me i hastened to the room of the secretary and found him pacing the floor rapidly in his dressing-gown saying that the retreat must be prevented he showed me the dispatch i immediately wrote an order assuming command of the military division of the mississippi and telegraphed it to general rosecrans i then telegraphed to him the order from washington assigning thomas to the command of the army of the cumberland and to thomas that he must hold chattanooga at all hazards informing him at the same time that i would be at the front as soon as possible a prompt reply was received from thomas saying we will hold the town till we starve i appreciated the force of this dispatch later when i witnessed the condition of affairs which prompted it it looked indeed as if but two courses were open one to starve the other to surrender or be captured on the morning of the twentieth of october i started with my staff and proceeded as far as nashville at that time it was not prudent to travel beyond that point by night so i remained in nashville until the next morning here i met for the first time andrew johnson military governor of tennessee he delivered a speech of welcome his composure showed that it was by no means his maiden effort it was long and i was in torture while he was delivering it fearing something would be expected from me in response i was relieved however the people assembled having apparently heard enough at all events they commenced a general handshaking which although trying where there is so much of it was a great relief to me in this emergency from nashville i telegraphed to burnside who was then at knoxville that important points in his department ought to be fortified so that they could be held with the least number of men to admiral porter at cairo that sherman's advance had passed eastport mississippi that rations were probably on their way from st louis by boat for supplying his army and requesting him to send a gunboat to convoy them and to thomas suggesting that large parties should be put at work on the wagon road then in use back to bridgeport on the morning of the twenty first we took the train for the front reaching stevenson alabama after dark rosecrans was there on his way north he came into my car and we held a brief interview in which he described very clearly the situation at chattanooga and made some excellent suggestions as to what should be done my only wonder was that he had not carried them out 
We then proceeded to Bridgeport, where we stopped for the night. From here we took horses and made our way by Jasper and over Waldron's Ridge to Chattanooga. There had been much rain, and the roads were almost impassable from mud, knee-deep in places, and from washouts on the mountain sides. I had been on crutches since the time of my fall in New Orleans, and had to be carried over places where it was not safe to cross on horseback. The roads were strewn with the debris of broken wagons and the carcasses of thousands of starved mules and horses. At Jasper, some ten or twelve miles from Bridgeport, there was a halt. General O. O. Howard had his headquarters there. From this point, I telegraphed Burnside, to make every effort to secure five hundred rounds of ammunition for his artillery and small arms. We stopped for the night at a little hamlet some ten or twelve miles further on. The next day we reached Chattanooga a little before dark. I went directly to General Thomas's headquarters, and remaining there a few days, until I could establish my own. During the evening, most of the general officers called in to pay their respects and to talk about the condition of affairs. They pointed out on the map the line, marked with a red or blue pencil, which Rosecrans had contemplated falling back upon. If any of them had approved the move, they did not say so to me. I found General W. F. Smith occupying the position of chief engineer of the Army of the Cumberland. I had known Smith as a cadet at West Point, but had no recollection of having met him after my graduation in 1843 up to this time. He explained the situation of the two armies and the topography of the country so plainly that I could see it without an inspection. I found that he had established a sawmill on the banks of the river by utilizing an old engine found in the neighborhood, and by rafting logs from the north side of the river above, had got out the lumber and completed pontoons and roadway plank for a second bridge, one flying bridge being there already. He was also rapidly getting out the materials and constructing the boats for a third bridge. In addition to this, he had far under way, a steamer for plying between Chattanooga and Bridgeport whenever we might get possession of the river. This boat consisted of a scow, made of the plank sawed out at the mill, housed in, and a stern wheel attached which was propelled by a second engine taken from some shop or factory. I telegraphed to Washington this night, notifying General Halleck of my arrival, and asking to have General Sherman assigned to the command of the Army of the Tennessee, headquarters in the field. The request was at once complied with. End of section 40. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at joc.clev.com.